Assalamu alaikum, everybody. My dear brothers and sisters, welcome to, the, to today's Juma khutbah, which we have been doing uh, online. Today, we have a special guest khatib, who uh, is uh, Professor Muqtadir Khan. Uh, he is a dear friend and old friend, uh, a well-known academic, uh, who is not pure, a pure academic, he is an academic who is also an activist. He is an academic who is not only interested in Islam, but also in the intersection points between Islam, community, political science. And he's written a, a book which took him a number of years to write, uh, in which he talked about building a community of muhsins. It's an important book because in it, he, uh, he uh, promotes his thesis that, uh, that uh, Hassan, which as many of you and all of you know, is one of the key uh, tripartite themes in Islam, Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, uh, he articulates the, uh, the, um, the thesis that a community of muhsins who focus on Ihsan, which is virtue, good behavior, ethical behavior, uh, and if that can be uh, infiltrated into our political discourse and political systems, what a, what a heightened quality the Muslim Ummah would accomplish. We are very happy to have him here and I uh, look forward to his khutbah as I'm sure all of you uh, and, uh, and, and, its meaningful, and its meaningfulness. He has a chapter there which was my favorite chapter, chapter five, which he talks about Ihsan in a way that is extremely heart melting and heart moving. So I certainly recommend this book to any of all of you who uh, who, uh, who do read and who like to read uh, as something that would, would, would be beneficial. So now I ask our brother Behruz to call the uh, Adhan of, of Jumu'ah. Inna alhamdulillah, inna ahmaduhu wa nastahinuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa na'uzu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. Man yahdihillahu falamudillala wa man yudlin falahadiyala. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa ahdahu la sharika la. Ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. Qala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi kitabihi. Awzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuhal lazina amunu attaqullaha haqqa tukhatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. Ya ayyuhal nas attaqu rabbukum allazi khalaqakum min nafsin wahidah wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa passa minhuma rijalan kaseeran wa nisaa'a. Attaqu allah. الذي تساءلون به وهم إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا. The brothers and sisters, I want to remember this part of the ayah because I'll be referring to it later in the khutbah. إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا. Indeed, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has His divine gaze upon us. قال الله سبحانه وتعالى أيضا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وخلوا خولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويكفر لكم ذنوبكم. وَمَنْ يُوتِيَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَعَذَا فَوْزًا عَزِيمًا أَمَّا بَعْدِ Dear brothers and sisters, As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I consider it a blessing and one of the highlights of my life that I get an opportunity to speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the community of Cordoba House. I'm very grateful for Imam Rauf to give me this opportunity. I'm also grateful that you're here to listen to me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when we mention his name in a company, he mentions our name in a more beautiful company. So as we remember Allah today, I hope he remembers us in the company of angels. Amen. I want to start the khutbah by talking about something that is very fundamental to all of us. It is asking the question, what is the purpose of creation? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create us and this entire creation? It is but natural that as thinking beings, we reflect on why we exist and why this creation exists. I think we would not be human if we did not. Even Hay ibn Yaqzan, who was brought up by an antelope in an island in a novel written by Ibn Tufair, even he pondered on the existence of the creation and the mystery behind the creation of the creation. I think our humanity begins with this question. We become human when we ask this question, why is there this creation? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, 
وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنْ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونِ and this is a very standard answer. You ask any scholar of Islam, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create us? He will say that he has created both humans and jinns for nothing except to worship him. Now, it depends on a minimalist or a broad understanding of this ayah. If you say that li ya'buduni means to worship me, that we tend to think of worship as ritual, offering salah, doing zikr, doing tarawih, fasting in the month of Ramadan. So worship, in, at least within the Islamic context, is overshadowed considerably with the idea of ritual worship. However, if we were to think of this ayah as, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنْ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونِي as I have created you for nothing else except to serve me rather than worship me then it expands the meaning of worship to include struggle for social justice, to fight for the civil rights of others, to fight against poverty, to establish order in society, to fight against other ills that we witness. So suddenly the purpose of existence is profoundly expanded if we understand li as to serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not just worship him in a ritual fashion. And I think that is probably a better understanding of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. If you ask this question to some of the tasawwuf related scholars, they will narrate a very beautiful hadith of Qudsi, which goes something like this. Kuntu kanzan maqfiyan fa ahbabtu an arf fa khalaqtu al khalq likai arf. So according to this hadith of Qudsi, hadith of Qudsi is a hadith in which Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam is either quoting or paraphrasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I was a hidden jewel. I was a hidden treasure. I loved to be known, so I created the creation to be known. So this creation is his self-revelation. This is a tajalli of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is manifesting himself so that he can be known. He doesn't need to be known. He's al-ghani. He has no need of any kind, but he has a desire. He loves to be known. And so he created knowing beings to be known. And traditional scholars said that these two verses are also very consistent in meaning this, this hadith and the ayah that I quoted. But in my research in this book that uh, Imam Rauf so, so generously introduced to you, I found something very interesting, which has made me think once again about the purpose of creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Mulk in the second ayah, أَوْزِ بِاللَّهِ مِنِ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّمَانِ الرَّحِيمِ أَلَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتِ وَالْحَيَاتِ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ أَمْنًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, He is the one who has created death and life so that He may test you all to see which of you has done Ahsan Amr. Now, it is a very interesting way, you know, the Quran has many verses where you have this phrase, amal es salihin, which means to do good deeds. And most English translations also translate ahsanu amalan, also as if ahsan is an adjective, which is what it is not in this, ahsanu amalan. So the, who are the most beautiful in deeds? And that is how I think we should understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us to test which of us is pursuing Ahsan in our actions, Ahsanu Amal. He also says in Surah Al-Hud, وَهُوَ أَلَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ فِي سِسْتَةُ أَيَّامِ وَكَانَ عَرْشُهُ عَلَىٰ عَلَىٰ الْمَاعِ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Same idea, that we have created you to see which of you does Ahsan in the deeds. So to me, it is apparent that the purpose of creation is to pursue Ahsan. Ahsan is the purpose of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. So, so then in order to realize this purpose of our existence, we really need to understand what is Ahsan. So what is Ahsan? If we had a ladder of human aspirations, Ahsan would be the highest rung on that ladder. And one step above that, you wouldn't exist. You'd be one with the one. 
Ihsan, if you look at Islamic tradition, if you read the Quran and the Ahadith, it is apparent that it has a duality to it. It is a dual aspect to Ihsan. It is both a maqam and a hal. Maqam means it's a place. Maqam is your spiritual place, your spiritual achievement, your spiritual status. It is a spiritual destination. Where have you reached? For example, some Suf Sufis will talk about Maqam in Muhammad, Prophet a, a, a spiritual state, a status that very few prophets have achieved. Uh, I think only Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and Musa salam, have reached the Maqam of Ihsan, and I'll tell you shortly why. But it is also a hal, it is a condition. You know, as we grew up, I grew up in India, and since childhood I've been hearing this phrase, kya hal hai, kya hal hai? and in the Arab world they say, kaifa halak. And we often understand that people are asking you basically, how are you, what's your cholesterol level, how, how's your weight, or how's your health, how's your bank balance, kya hal hai? are you doing well? But actually I realize that they are not asking that question. Our culture taught us to ask people, what is your spiritual state? Where are you in your spiritual development? So when we say kya hal hai, kaifa hal hai, like where are you spiritually? Are you aspiring to achieve ihsan or not? So when you say ihsan is a maqam, you are in a state where you're perpetually in a state of ihsan, which I think is the highest of aspirations. But when you say you are in a hal, you can momentarily be in a state of extreme spirituality. You could like, be ecstatic, you could become intoxicated uh, like the intoxicated Sufism of Rumi and say, oh my God, I feel so intoxicated, I give away all my 401k in charity. And then of course, later on when you come down, you start wondering whether that was a wise move or not. However, Hal is a temporary state, Maqam is a permanent state. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, this is in Surah Al-Ankabut, those who struggle in us and we guide them to our ways and indeed Allah is with those who are muhsins Allah is with those who have achieved the state of ihsan in Surah Al-Baqarah, in the 195th ayah of Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa ahsanu inna Allah yuhibbul muhsin. This ayah is, this part of the ayah is very profound. In this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not stating something. He's commanding us. He's saying, do beautiful things. Do ahsan. Indeed, Allah loves those who are in a state of ahsan or who are muhsins who have achieved ahsan. In Surah Al-Araf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna rahmatullahi kharibun min al Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, the mercy of Allah is nearer to those who are in the state of Ihsan. So if you think of Ihsan as a destination, and as you approach Ihsan, Allah's mercy approaches you. So the point at which you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's grace meet is the point of Ihsan. Inna rahmatullahi kharibun min al And of course, there is those two famous ahadiths which also tell us and teach us about Hassan. One is the hadith of Jibreel. It is the number one hadith in uh, uh, Sahih Muslim. And it is also uh, the number two in Imam Nawawi's. Uh, if, if and when I meet with him, I have to ask him why it is number two and not number one in his collection. So this Hadith of Jibril is something phenomenal. If you have not read it, please go back and read it immediately today. And I think every Muslim should read the Hadith of Jibril at least once a month. It is the only seminar, it is the only seminar on religion and spirituality which was co-taught by a prophet and an angel. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Jibreel Alayhi Salaam together publicly taught Muslims what their deen is. In that hadith, according to that hadith, Jibreel Alayhi Salaam asked a series of questions about what is Islam, what is Iman, what is Ihsan, and about the science of the Day of Judgment. And when he asked Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
أخبرني عن الإحسان tell me about إحسان he says أن تعبد الله كأنك تراه وإن لم تكن تراه وإنه يراك so he's saying that إحسان is to worship Allah as if you see him but if you cannot see him then at least be aware that he sees you so إحسان is either to gaze upon the divine or at least to be conscious of the fact that the divine gaze is upon you. So the, so the highest form of Ahsan is to gaze upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like the dua of Musa alayhi salam in the Quran, Rabbi arini unzurik ilayka. Ya Allah, show thyself so that I may gaze upon you. What Musa alayhi salam was saying is, Ya Allah, take me to the maqam of Ahsan, where life is as if you have made eye contact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, the other hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah kataba al ihsan ala kulli shay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded the believers to do ihsan in whatever they do. Uh, and the example that he gives is even if you're slaying an animal, even if you're sacrificing an animal, do it with ihsan. Ihsan is mercy, ihsan is compassion, ihsan is love, ihsan is forgiveness. So even if you do something, as terrible as killing something, whether you're cutting a tree or slaughtering an animal for sacrifice, do it with love, with compassion, with forgiveness. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Auzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Inna allaha wa malaikatahu yusallun ala nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. As a social scientist, I'm trained to ask the so what question. So what, now that we know about Ihsan. Ihsan is to live life as if you have made an eye contact with God. As if you're looking at God, to offer your ibadat, your service, to everything that you do in life, whatever it is, to do it as if you are looking at God while you're doing it. And if you're not that fortunate, then at least be aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking at you. So how does it apply? One thing that people don't realize, that even it's in its profoundest spiritual dimension, Islam is a very practical religion. It is not divorced from the dunya. Uh, Mullah Nasruddin, you all know very well, there was a time when Mullah Nasruddin used to work as a boatman. And one day he was on the river with a boat and he had a client who wanted him to take him across. The client was this pompous academic scholar, philosopher. And so the Mullah tells him, Salaam Alaikum, who are you? And the guy says, I'm a mushtahid. Uh, I'm a talib al-ilm, I'm a student of knowledge and I teach at the university, I'm a professor, blah, blah, blah. Generally he keeps bragging about him. So the mullah says, so what is your research on? He said, my research is on ishtihad. He said, really? I don't know what is ishtihad. Can you tell me what is ishtihad? And the professor looks astonished. He says, you don't know about ishtihad? My God, half your life is wasted. How can you be a Muslim and not know about ishtihad? Man, half your life is wasted. Of course, Mullah Nasruddin is not very happy with it. And as they are going, he suddenly noticed that there is a hole in the boat and the boat has begun to sink. So he asked this profound scholar, so do you know how to swim? And he says, no, I was so busy all my life studying all these great books. I never had the time to learn how to swim. So Mullah said, oh my God, you don't know how to swim. Your entire life is gone. So the point that Mullah was trying to make in this story is that you have to balance both. Read all the books, but also make sure that you learn how to swim. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, tie the camel first, then trust in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So there is this practical aspect to it. So now that we know what is Ahsan, how do we bring about Ihsan in our lives? And I think that we can bring our Ihsan into our life by recognizing that Islam is not just a path to success in the life in the hereafter, it is also success in the life in the here. So how does our knowledge of Ihsan help us in this world? How can we take a cosmology and make it a philosophy of life? Let us look at the two greatest challenges of our time in our country. One is inequity, the gap between the rich and the poor, 
is becoming so unbearable, it is unbelievable. There are people in this country who make more money in one minute than I make in a lifetime. And now the other illness that profoundly affects us is racism. So how can Ahsan help us combat this both? I unpack Ahsan into many components, but two of them I want to talk very briefly. One is murahaba and muhasaba, and the other is fana. Remember, I told you to remember this one. Inna alaykum raqiban. Allah is one whose gaze is upon you. So murahaba and muhasaba is this awareness that God is watching us. It is the opposite of mushahada, where we are watching God, but here God is gazing upon us. And because of that, we want to be on our best behavior. So muhasaba is to take account consistently of our life every day. Was I a good person today? Did I do anything to achieve ihsan? Uh, did I miss an opportunity to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not? And the other is to be vigilant, that is murahaba. To be vigilant, have I done something bad? Have I hurt somebody? Do I need to apologize to somebody? Do I need to make up for some damage that I have done? So this is personal. This is how you do tasqiyah and nafs. This is how you purify your soul and you elevate yourself in, in your maqamat and try to go up and up the ladder of spirituality. So if we try to bring this habit of murahaba and muhasaba into our society, we will have a self-critical society where we, we would as a community, as a society, as a nation publicly ask ourselves the question, did the last presidential debate reflect our values? Is this who we are? Can't we do better as America? Can we do better as human beings? So that is the vigilance, a murakaba, a self-critical posture, which in spiritual teaching is individualistic. We have to make it collective at the level of society and community. The other is fana. Now fana is, in my opinion, and the opinion of scholars everywhere, the highest state of uh, spirituality. Fana is self-annihilation, which means you do not exist. You do not exist. You have become one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The metaphor that people often use is dropping a drop into the ocean. Once you drop the drop of water into the ocean, you can never find the drop because it has become fana in the ocean. So when we as individuals submit completely and entirely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Completely. And without any reservations, we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entirely. Then we become fana. But in social life, fana would be to worry less about ourselves and worry a little bit more about others. In the Quran, in Surah Al-Rahman, there is this famous ayah, Kullu man alayha fan, wa yabkha wajhu rabbuka, Everything that exists will perish. The only thing that will remain is the visage of your Lord who is noble and majestic. So why attach ourselves to those things that will perish? Let's focus on that which is eternal. And in order to focus on that which is eternal, we have to abandon all that which is temporal. And that is where we can find an antidote to the racism, to the identity politics that is plaguing our country today. By asking ourselves, how can I bring fana into society? And, and this may seem very counterintuitive to you all, and many of you may not even like it, is to be less assertive about your identity and more assertive about the rights and identity of others. That is the beginning of fana, I think, in the social sphere. I work for you, not for myself. I don't ask the world what it's going to give me. I ask others, what do you need? Can I help you get that? And I think that if we bring these two virtues into the public sphere, we develop a society which is vigilant, which practices murahaba institutionally which does muhasaba, we have something called a government accounting office, which is supposed to do muhasaba, but like everything else in the US these days, uh, our institutions have abandoned their democratic responsibilities. 
So the GAO is not doing its acts of muhasaba. The Congress is supposed to act as vigilant against uh, the presidential powers has uh, basically abdicated those powers. But if we can revive these values of muraqaba, vigilance, and fana, which is self-sacrifice, I think we can help create a society of Muslims. We can create a society where people are looking forward to loving each other and trying to live a life as if, as if they have made eye contact with God. And people, you know, I want to end with, a, with another story about Sufis. There used to be a Sufi who went up the hill, like Jack and Jill, he went up the hill. And he sat there and said, oh, this is such a beautiful place. Let me sit here and do zikr. And he remembered the ayah from zikr, Uskurullah zikran kasiran. So he started sitting there and remembering Allah. An hour passed, two hours passed, and then he started feeling hungry. And there was a tree and an apple fell from the tree. So he ate that apple and then continued doing zikr. A little while later, he felt thirsty. There was a rock from which water poured out. And he was saying, wow. I'm already seeing divine miracles. So he just stayed there for a couple of decades, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, eating apples, drinking water for free. But in those 20 years, his coat that he used to wear kind of wore off and he needed a new coat. So he came down the hill into the world and he was horrified. He was just horrified by what he saw. There were riots, people were fighting over each other. There was police brutality all around him. People were discriminated because of their skin color. People were being discriminated because of their nationality. People were being discriminated because of their choices in lifestyle. And poor people had no options to go out. He was just horrified by the social conditions, the rampaging social injustice in the village that he had left. He couldn't bear it. He forgot about his coat and he just ran up the mountain screaming and he said, Ya Allah, what has happened to the dunya? So he heard a voice. He says, what has happened? He says, the dunya has become horrible. It's unbearable. Why don't you do something, Ya Allah? And he hears the voice say, I have already done something. And the Sufi is perplexed. He says, what have you done? If you had done something, why would the things be in such a horrible state? So Allah said, I created you. And that is something, when I read this the first time, I was profoundly moved because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is potentially going to ask each one of us and hold us accountable for the injustices that we see and witness in our societies. There's inequity and racism in America. So I, as an American, as an American Muslim especially, he who knows about Ahsan and knows about the Day of Judgment will be held accountable, perhaps even more than Trump. Because I know the truth. I have the true message of God. And I'm a follower of the true messenger. So my responsibility is more than that of anybody else. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Sufi, I created you, he said, I created you, Ta'buduni, not to just sit there on the hill and worship me but to go down the hill into the trenches and fight for social justice. That is how you can help me. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he helps us all understand the meaning of Ihsan. He helps us every day to move forward spiritually up the ladder towards Ihsan. I hope that one day all of us achieve the maham of Ihsan and we can truly call ourselves as a member of the Society of Muslims. I also pray that at least once in a day, at least once in a week, at least once in a month, or at least once in a lifetime, we achieve the hal of Ihsan. We do something and it feels as if we have made eye contact with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ayyuhaladzina amanu, uskurullaha zikran kaseeran. إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون وقيم الصلاة. اللهم تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم واغفر لنا وارحمنا إنك أنت الغفور الرحيم واختم لنا منك بخير أجمعين. أو الله we supplicate to you, Ya Allah, with hearts that turn to you, hearts that are humble to you. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you, Ya Allah.
we thank you uh, for giving us the blessing of standings and we ask you to accept our prayers, accept our standings, our bowings, our prostrations, our recitations of the verses of your noble book, Ya Allah. Allah, we ask you to accept and to penetrate into our hearts the words of wisdom that our brother, Professor Muqtadir Khan, taught us today from your noble book about Ihsan, about, about completely surrendering ourselves to Ya Allah, surrendering our egos to Ya Allah, and to help us build a community of muhsins, Ya Allah, who do not only worship you, but who also serve your cause and serve you by being your channels for social justice and, and, and love and compassion in the dunya. O oh Allah, we ask you to fill our hearts with your light, to fill our minds with your understanding, to teach us and to help us hear with your hearing, and to understand with your understanding and to see with your seeing, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, we ask you to bless our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, and to grant us all the good things that he asked you to grant his ummah, and to protect us, Ya Allah, from all of the negative things that he begged you to distance from his ummah, and things that you know are bad for us, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, each of us, has in our hearts our individual supplications. We wrap them all together, Ya Allah, and convey them to you by the, and, and ask for your acceptance by the intercession of the name of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and by the intercession of our collective recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad alayhi salatu wassalam. A'udhu billah. من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين 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 Subhan rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salam ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen My dear brothers and sisters, I'm sure on behalf of all of us, uh, I wish to thank our dear and beloved brother, Professor Muqtadil Khan, for his very, very, very moving khutbah today. You can see why I call him not only an academic, but an academic who is also an activist, whose uh, activism is informed by not only his scholarship of his Islam, but also by his spirituality and his conviction in, uh, in, in Allah and in the commandments that Allah has, uh, has given to all of us through his beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. We pray that Allah will bless him and that we will have, uh, give us more opportunities inshallah to hear him and to hear his his wisdom and his experiences uh, may allah bless you my dear brother professor Muqtadr, and we are grateful to you for this now it has come to the end of our session of jama i bid all of you have to have a very blessed remainder of this day juma mubaraka as we say a blessed juma inshallah a blessed rest of the day and as allah has commanded us when the prayer is over do not forget to remember Allah. Always ذكر الله even after you have uh, have finished your prayer. So please remember Allah in your hearts, in your tongues, and in your minds as you continue with your day and continue with your work. My dear brothers and sisters, I bid you assalamu alaikum. We look forward to our next gathering, insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.